Uh, so hi everybody. Uh, it's Wednesday, April 7th. It's National Coffee Cake Day and also National Walking Day. So let's walk on over to our live shadowing session. That was bad. But anyways, welcome to our live se session today. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to welcome you all and introduce you all to our program and opportunities if you have previously attended our shadowing session. So pre-health shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, and women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Ni. I am going to be the co-host today at Pre-Health Shadowing. Thank you all so much for attending today. Let's get started. So as you can see on the screen, we have a little PSA. We do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. This setting is available towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you need assistance enabling the transcript, please direct message one of me or our lovely team members. We are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everybody. So please, if you have recommendations for how we can improve, you can email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Uh, so since this is an international program, ooh, poll, we want to know where are you Zooming from today? Drop it in the chat. Personally, I am from Chicago. So yeah, we love to see that representation from the Midwest. All right, yeah. Students, there's a Very poll cool. up as well if you want to chat where you're from. Let's see, give about five more seconds. People join in. And three, two, one. Not, we got people from all over the world today. Nice. Awesome. All right, so moving on, we, if you want to stay in the loop, follow us on social media. We are active on Instagram and TikTok, or you can sign up for our email list on our website to never miss a session. We don't take attendance, but don't miss a session. We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits for being part of our program. Some of these benefits include partnering with Kaplan. We have partnered with Kaplan to get you guys a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products as well as free resources, such as study guides to help prepare you for standardized tests like the MCAT, PCAT, and the NCLEX. If you fill out our short survey in the chat, you will get hooked up with this. So it's a great resource that I recommend checking out. Next, we would like to draw your attention to another amazing program, Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for students. College and young adulthood is not a walk in the park. So it's stressful enough as it is in non-pandemic times. For pre-health professionals especially, we know the path is not easy. That's why we have partnered with Neolith to give you guys free access to their services if you use the link in the chat or enter the code PREHEALTH when signing up. Moving on, mask for mask. Mask for Mask is an amazing women-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic, those in the homeless community, healthcare workers without the proper PPE, and others who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, again, PHS15, you can get 15% off your order. If you buy through this method, pre-health shadowing will also get 10% of the proceeds which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs solely off of the support and work of our students. So let's say that you love PHS so much and you wanna join our family. You can definitely join and you can, we can adopt you. We would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be a part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects, initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, and so much more. We understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your own time. We would love to have you be a part of this program and our family and contribute your own unique perspective. Next, moving on to the little youngins, the high school students. Uh, if you want to get involved, we are starting a program called HTP or High School Training 
for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and organize resources for other high school students interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. We want to recognize the hard work of all of our students in the program. So if you are interested in getting published, you could submit essays, reflections, research paper, poetry, just about anything. And these will be reviewed by our editor in chief through the link dropped in the chat to have your work on our website. This will look great on CVs, applications, resumes, etc. So take advantage of this. Part of our mission at PHS is to promote diversity. And so in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels to celebrate different demographics in the field of medicine. And so some of these are like a COVID-19 roundtable, an international student forum, and so, so much more. And if you have a mentor, professor, or professional who has inspired you and could think to contribute to these conversations, nominate them today using the link in the chat. If you can, we also humbly ask that you donate to our program. As I have said, pre health shadowing is completely student run. We are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everybody. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free, so any contribution you could give would be greatly appreciated. If you're not financially able, we request you that you send this link to someone you think can in order to continue to support those who cannot afford similar opportunities. Next, throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat. Our team members will be making note of these to be asked in the latter half of the session. Take good notes as our professional is going over their presentation as there will be the chance to take a post shadowing assessment to verify your virtual shadowing hours with a shiny certificate. More information will be available on this at the end of the session, so stay tuned. Last but not least, we request that you turn your cameras on. This is by no means any obligations as we are respectful of different circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together like a family in a time when socially distancing is mandatory. I am not the pre uh, professional. There's no quiz for me or for this intro. So I appreciate you for listening to my spiel. Now I would like to welcome our professional, Dr. Cook. Thank you so much for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. That was a um, great introduction. Uh, once again, I'm very impressed with the organization you guys have. I think it's a great way for you to pool resources um, and really help people no matter what aspect they're in uh, of their training. Um, I'm a little further out than a lot of people on this call, but I definitely remember the struggle and, and I'm not somebody where school or exams came easily. Um, virtually nobody who gets to my level does it without struggling at some point, uh, whether it's getting into medical school or residency or, or you know, getting the top choice or, or, or getting what you're looking for, uh, you judge people more by their failures and successes. So if you are struggling or if you are looking for that next step, I think organizations like yours are really helpful. Basically today I'm gonna do a very brief lecture of what my job is, a little bit of insight into orthopedic surgery, um, specifically sports medicine, but I also do quite a bit of trauma and joint replacement as well couple tidbits of, of really where to start your focus if you think this is what you're interested in as early as medical school. Some of the things that can really help your applications. Um, ironically, I took my third set of board exams two years ago and I've been with my wife ever since my last year of undergrad. And the joke is uh, in my family is, uh, oh, Chris has a big test coming up. And after I take the test, I get together with friends and family and say, how was it? I'm like, oh, it's pretty good. They're like, how many more do you have? I'm always like, oh, there's another one in two weeks or there's another one in a month. And uh, after my third board exam, I said for the first time uh, in the 18 or 19 years, that was the last one. Um, and I still have to keep up my skills and my continued education. Every 10 years I have to certify, but um, it's, a, it's a long road, hundreds of exams, thousands of hours studying. But uh, my wife, who is in the medical field, we always talk all the time. If she won the lottery, she would be done with work. She would quit the next day. There's a lot of things in her life there fulfilling she would do. Um, if I won the lottery, I'd go to work tomorrow. I, I love my job. I love what I do. I might not work as hard if I won the lottery because uh, I do work a lot of hours, but um, operate on people and seeing them get better. Um, not many people get to do that. And so uh, 
any form of medicine, I think is very rewarding. In this last year, I think we've, we've considered a lot of our medical staff to be heroes. Um, so if you ever get discouraged, I think the majority of doctors will say they may not like the direction medicine is going, but they wouldn't trade being a doctor for the world. So uh, my name is Christopher Cook. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, a sports medicine specialist at the Detroit Medical Center in uh, Detroit, Michigan. I'm also uh, an assistant professor at Wayne State uh, University School of Medicine. Uh, I'm an assistant professor, both the DMC residency and fellowship. Um, here is one of my uh, cards in case you are ever in the Detroit area talking about some of the services I offer. Disclosures, I, I, I am a consultant for a company called Arthrex that helps make some of the products that we help people with operating. Um, I think that's also something very nice. It may not affect this lecture, but if I have a tool or a procedure or something, I'm not happy about the way we do it. I help design tools to help us do it better. And I think that all companies, this one specifically for me helps me do that. Obviously, if I can help design better tools, I can treat patients differently. I can help other doctors. I can, I can do a lot of things. Um, I don't do it for monetary reasons, um, but I think it's cool to be involved in uh, technology and innovation. Uh, my training, um, I, I'm very homegrown in Michigan. Um, I did my undergraduate, my graduate degree at the University of Michigan. I went to medical school in Detroit at Wayne State. I did my residency at a couple of hospitals in the Detroit area called the Detroit Medical Center and uh, Providence Hospital. And then I went to Los Angeles, California for my fellowship. I do support getting out of your comfort zone and traveling for some part of your training. A uh, place I went to is called Curlin Job Sports Medicine. Dr. Robert Colonel and Frank Job were two of the first sports medicine doctors in this country. Uh, it's where the majority of professional athletes, no matter where you're from, go for their training. So uh, it's not breaking HIPAA. It's well in the news. But if you're Tom Brady, if you're Kobe Bryant, if you're Manny Pacquiao, uh, if you're Saquon Barkley, you're getting on a plane and you're going to California and that's where you're getting fixed. So I, I learned from the best um, and I doubt take care of some professional teams, but I, I bring that skill level to my patients. Uh, this is my company, DMC Orthopedic Sports Medicine. I'm one of the team doctors for the Detroit Tigers. I'm a consultant for the Red Wings. Um, I also take care of a soccer team in Detroit called Detroit FC City that won the championship last year. It's one level below LML, MLS. Um, the team doctor for a baseball league called United Shore Baseball League. It was actually the first professional sports league to start playing sports after the COVID pandemic. Um, so not even from a sports medicine background, from a medicine background, we had to learn how to test and isolate and quarantine these players. Take care of many high schools in the area. Taking care of high school athletes is probably the most rewarding part of my job. If you're on this call today and that means you're talented, you're motivated uh, in academics, that means you've probably been motivated in athletics at some point in your life as well. Uh, this is where I'm located, Detroit, Michigan. This is my hospital. Um, in my training, I took care of several other teams. Um, this was Colonel Job, Dr. Neil Eltrosh, the head of the fellowship, my family on the beach. Um, living on the beach for a year was the best thing ever, and I highly recommend it if you're lucky enough to have that experience someday. During my year there, I got to do team coverage for many different teams to go through very quickly. Los Angeles Dodgers, Los Angeles Sparks, the WNBA team that did win the championship. Here's me caught on the phone on, on the championship game in NBC. Um, got to take care of USC football, LMU basketball, Anaheim Ducks, LA Kings, where these are my seats during the games. I uh, got to go in the locker room. Uh, Los Angeles Rams, this is me at the Combine. Uh, World Baseball Classic, which is basically the Olympics where the US baseball team did win the championship, got to celebrate in the locker room with them. Uh, Oakland Athletics, Los Angeles Dodgers spring training again. Um, just a really great year uh, and got to combine my love of athletics with my love of medicine. And then here's me in the OR, which is truly my favorite place to be. I think surgery is incredibly challenging and it was never easy for me. And the fact that if you practice hard enough and if you care about patients, you can be good at it, it makes me feel very uh, rewarded. So let's talk a little bit about the outline as I toss my setup in the air on the right side of your screen. We'll talk a little bit about the keys, in my opinion, to medical education. Um, Got to work hard. Uh, if you're not willing to work hard, unless you're a super genius, you're, you're not going to, to make it in any realm of healthcare. But you have to enjoy life. We, we understand burnout better now more than ever. And if you work, work, work without play, you're not going to do yourself or, or your patients any good. So... You need to enjoy life. Some of the ways to do this is appreciate your family. If you're lucky enough to be near them, make time for them. Um, we grow up with our family, then we get away from when we start getting our education. And uh, sometimes you need to go home, let your parents take care of you, be around your siblings. If you have a significant other or children, uh, be there for them. Friends, these are my co-residents. Um, 
I'm close with my co-residents, some of my best ones I grew up with. They, they really train with you. And um, whether you're pre-med in medical school in training, I still to this day call people I went to medical school with and ask them questions. Really, it's not so competitive. It's dog eat dog. You can't establish relationships. You, you need to in order to survive. Fitness. I uh, get frustrated with medical professionals who are overweight, who smoke, who drink too much, who do, do drugs. If we want our patients to listen to us, we have to have a good example. Um, I am a college athlete. I still try to stay in shape. So uh, maybe um, I'm at the end of that spectrum where I expect a lot out of my patients. But if I'm going to tell somebody to work hard and then they look at me and, and they don't think I know what hard work looks like, it's hypocritical. But uh, my patients know my pedigree and they know how hard I work. And this is me doing a, a Tough Mudder race. And um, I just, I love exercise. And I think we need to incorporate it a lot with our patients, especially at a, another level. If you're a primary care doctor, you need to know about nutrition. We need to do more um, disease uh, prevention instead of disease treating. Remember, it gets better. Um, I loved undergraduate, but it was very difficult for me to get into medical school. I liked some things about medical school. It was very difficult for me. Every exam was stressful. I really struggled. I wasn't sad when medical school was over. Training was difficult, but I was doing what I loved, which motivated me. Then fellowship was amazing, and now working's amazing. So basically, every step gets better. It's different, but um, the further you go on, the more enjoyable it gets. So if you're struggling with where you're at, the next step will be better. Let's talk about training. I did my training at the University of Michigan. So if you are a college student, uh, or even if you're a high school student who's going to go to college and do a pre-health training, what do you have to focus on? Um, I'm on the admissions board at Wayne State School of Medicine. So I interview candidates to either um, give them uh, acceptance or denial into medical school. These things move around, but the very first things we look at is GPA and MCAT. There, there is a certain cutoff. I definitely don't think these are the most important things you need for medical school. They don't make a good doctor or not, but they are objective tests that we look at. So. You need to take care of business. You need to work hard. You need to learn. And you have to have a GPA and MCAT that reflects it. Do you need a 4.0? No, you do not. Um, and if you're more talented in other attributes, then the less impressive GPA you can make up for. But the better GPA and MCAT score you get, the more competitive you will be to get past the first round of cuts and get a face-to-face -face interview. So uh, I'm sorry that these objective tests are up there, but they're there for a reason. So just do your due diligence, work hard, study, do well on the exams so you can get the face-to-face -face interview. After that, volunteering, research, clubs, sports, work experience, life experience, shadowing, these all have different levels of impressiveness. If you wanted to go to an Ivy League medical school like a Harvard or a John Hopkins, they may wanna see your research experience. How many projects have you worked on? How many publications? Me, I like to see you're involved, but I like people who haven't been groomed to be a medical student. Uh, during the summer growing up, I painted houses. And I think that's really good blue blood, um, blue collar, like just work hard uh, experience. And when people will interview with me for medical school, I want to see that they did something like waiting tables. I want to see something, they did something where they know how to work hard. I want to see travel experience. Tell me where you've gone. Tell me what you've done. I want to see volunteering. I'm very um, sports oriented. I want to see that you did athletics at some point in your lifetime. If not athletics, how about music? How about art, something you're passionate about, language that's not medicine. And I wanna ask you about it. I wanna see your eyes light up about how you played basketball in high school. I wanna see your eyes light up how you did marching band. I wanna see you talk about sculpting or painting. So you need to be well-rounded. And once you get that minimum GPA and MCAT to get the interview, I don't look at it again. And I couldn't care less about it, but it's gotta get you to the interview date. Graduate school, I did not get into medical school after undergrad, um, my application was not impressive enough. So I went and got a master's and you can do several things in a gap year. You can get more education, you can volunteer. Um, what I will say is I picked a couple schools I wanted to go to in a geographical location of Michigan. I met with the admission department at each of them and I said, this is my application. You did not give me an interview. You did not let me into medical school. Um, what part of this application is most important for me to work on? And, and, you know, some of it was academics, so I got a master's. Some of it was volunteering, so I volunteered. But basically, I said, I respect your school. I respect I wasn't accepted. What can I work on? And every six months, I'd go back to them and say, I worked on it. What can I do next? And I think after about a year of that, they realized I was never going to go away until they let me into medical school. So 
I got a, a basic science master's. You can get a PhD, you can get an MBA. Schools are going to want to know why did you do it? What did you work on? What improvements did you make? And then they still want to know about that other stuff, but they'd already seen that stuff before. That was in the past. That was an undergrad. They want to see what you've done lately. Medical school. I was accepted to four different medical schools. I was very fortunate. I went to the medical school closest to my home to where my wife worked, Wayne State Medical School in uh, Detroit. Once you're in medical school, you have two years to do your academics, get ready for your boards, and then you start to figure out what type of medicine do you want to go into. Some types of medicines are more competitive than others. Some locations are more competitive than others. Once again, you have to apply, you have to interview. So what do we look for? Because I'm, I'm on the admissions committee for residents. Board scores used to be the most important thing you had to hit a cutoff, but luckily starting next year, step one USMLE is going to be pass or fail. That's really important because I don't think board scores make you a good resident or good doctor or not, but they have to be at a minimum for you to become a doctor. And now I don't have to look at numbers. I just have to make sure you pass. So if you're about to apply for residency, I apologize, you're the last year that this qualifies for, but for you people going in medical school, you're gonna have a pass fail. So that board score is not as important. Some people care about your class ranking. I don't, but other school, other programs will. Things I care about, when you did rotations, did you do well? What are your letters of recommendation? Um, what do the people who worked with you for a solid month as you did your pediatric surgical OBGYN psych rotations think about you? So you have to do a good job. You have to work hard. You have to impress people so they write letters for you. Other things like being AOA, top of your class, research and clubs are important. But if you spend a month with a person working hard, I want that letter from them to see what they say. And I don't really care if they're famous or not. I want to know how well they know you. Once you're in training, life gets better. I did my residency in Detroit. By that point, 10% um, of residents in orthopedic surgery don't do fellowships, 90% do. I wanted to be competitive. I wanted to be a professional team doctor, so I did. But by that point, things get a little easier. So once you apply for your fellowship, basically, they ask a little bit about board scores, a little bit about research, but basically they want your letters of recommendation. They wanna know how good you are in the OR. If you can operate at a base level and they can teach you advanced techniques, that's what they want. The nice part is, is as far as an orthopedic surgeon, there's more fellowship spots than residents. So no longer are you competitive trying to get something. Now you kind of get to pick. I got my number one choice for fellowship. Finally, as a fellow, I had a year on the beach, learned some skills and I had to find a job. So basically, once you're in fellowship, you learn, you look for a job. And I was lucky. The place that trained me really liked me. I was the chief resident. So before I graduated, they offered me a contract. All right. What is an orthopedic surgeon? What is a sports medicine specialist? This is kind of my byline. I use up-to-date, evidence-based surgical and non-surgical techniques. Make an individual treatment plan for each patient, emphasizing um, prevention of injury, trying to get patients back to do what they love. I've worked on several professional athletes that you'll see on, on TV. I work on a lot of high school and college athletes, but 95% of my patients are just people trying to be more active, lose weight, go for walks. Um, I'm very biased and nothing against medicine, but one of my favorite teachers one time said, the worst day in ortho is still better than the best day of medicine. That's my own personal uh, belief. I actually loved my medicine rotation. I loved every rotation I did in medical school, but I wake up every day excited for orthopedic surgery. So I hope that each one of you finds something you're as passionate about as I do. And I hope that if you ever have to see a doctor, they share that same passion. So I'm not bagging on medicine. I'm sure medical doctors would want nothing to do with ortho. Um, but this is funny. He, we were examining a patient who had a gunshot wound that we fixed. And he said, um, my, um, I've been having some trouble breathing. We listen to my lungs and we're orthopedic surgeons, but this doctor's like, yeah, I'll listen to your lungs. And he threw on the stethoscope and listened. And I'm like, did you hear anything? He's like, I don't know what I'm listening for, but I thought that was pretty funny. So, um, 90% of orthopedic surgery is learned within your first three months of medical school. Anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. And here's my favorite anatomist. This is my daughter when she's three years old. It's not so much that she gets the bones correct, it's the labeling. This, this was really impressive. She is uh, most likely gonna go in some form of the medical field. She's very interested, uh, she's very intelligent. Uh, and if she wants to do it, I, I look forward to, to having her become an orthopedic surgeon someday if she wants to. Trauma, I see a lot of trauma as an orthopedic surgeon. Trauma is very cool, it's not always tree branch through the shoulder cool, but it's usually very cool. And I worked in Detroit, where we actually have one of the highest levels of blunt trauma uh, in the world. 
Um, unfortunately, during my training, sometime 2012 or 13, there was a statistic that there were more gunshot wounds in Detroit than Iraq or Afghanistan that year. So here's a couple examples of trauma that I treat. Let's talk about a clavicle fracture. You fall off a skateboard, you get tackled in football, this collarbone breaks. 90% of time you can treat it non-operably, but when the, the stress level is high enough, your muscles like your sternocleidomastoid pull one fragment up and your arm and your pec pull the other arm down. So how do we treat this? If it has to be treated operatively, I make an open incision and I put the bones back together and I hold them together with a plate and screws. Sounds crazy, but if you know your anatomy, you know what muscles to avoid, you know where the nerves and the blood vessels are. Because as I put those screws in, I have to drill and fill. And if I plunge more than one to two centimeters, uh, I've got the subclavian artery right there. So if you know your anatomy, you know what you can do and what you can't do. Here's the x-ray afterwards and patients do very well. Other trauma, this is an x-ray of the femur and a femoral shaft fracture. And if it looks odd, this guy got shot two years ago, broke his femur, and so they put a nail down it. Then he got in a car accident and they bent the nail. So I had to fix him at that point. Um, one of my proudest moments, this is what I basically did for an hour. I put a contraption on the nail and I had to hit it as hard as I could to get it out of the femur. If you've seen this video, this is what we do when we do hardware removal. Uh, we have to get it out, it takes blunt force. Eventually, I did get that nail out. In fact, I sterilized it and I kept it. It reminds me of the struggle of that case. We then refixed him with the plate and screws. Tibial shaft fractures. If you remember this play from the NCAA tournament in 2014, a very young, healthy athlete fell when he landed from a jump shot, and you can see his tibia broke on the court. So we treat tibial shaft fractures very, very often, kind of like ankle fractures. Most of the time we do plate and screws. We do incisions to open up the bones, put them back where they belong, then hold them together with plates and screws. Um, something really neat about some ankle fractures, look at this young man. You might not believe it, this guy didn't feel any pain. He was a 65-year-old diabetic peripheral vascular disease. He simply was getting off, uh, off, off the toilet in the bathroom and in his ankle, moved the wrong way and he broke it, but he couldn't really feel his foot because of the neuropathy. And you might think, if I do surgery on somebody like this, who's sick, who doesn't have good blood flow, they're probably gonna get infected. So we actually didn't have to do surgery on him. This is his x-ray on the right before I reduced it simply by putting the bones back where they were. And on the right-hand side, that's afterward. And after I put the bones back where they were, I put a cast on him and he made a good recovery. He was able to walk kept his foot, didn't need surgery, didn't need incision, didn't have blood loss, didn't need anesthesia. We can manage most fractures non-operatively. You just have to know which ones you can and can't. Be careful. There's a lot of crazy things out there. The picture on your left-hand side is somebody who got stabbed with a knife and thank God missed every major blood vessel, nerve, and muscle in the hand. On the right is actually not a trauma. It's a genetic malformation, almost like a mirror hand where they're born with seven fingers. The crazy thing is, this patient grew up and, and they knew their hand was different, but they never got seen by a pediatrician until they were 18 years old. Here's some more trauma. I was on call for hand call 4th of July. You can guess what these are from, fireworks. Um, most of the time people bring the fingers in with them to the ER and our goal is to try to um, put them back together. So oftentimes we're lucky, sometimes we're not. Here's somebody that uh, had their finger caught in a car door they were getting out of the car, slammed their finger, and the car door drove the car drove off with their finger in it. So they, they got the finger and they brought it to the ER and we were able to reattach it. So as an orthopedic surgeon, we do a lot of trauma. A lot of it's cool, uh, but you have to know your anatomy if you know how to do it. Once again, total hand amputation, we were able to sew back on. Pediatric anatomy. If we thought normal anatomy was difficult, think about tiny little humans who have open growth plates all over the place. You have to respect the growth plates and know that while kids heal faster, if you make a mistake and don't treat them appropriately, you could damage them the rest of their life. Um, you have to know as an orthopedic surgeon, things like brachial plexus problems, herbs or clunky's palsy. As a baby's born, if, if they're pulled the wrong way or if their neck um, has an incre increased tension on while they're born, they can have uh, some nerve damage. So as an orthopedic surgeon, sometimes I see a baby, I'm able to make a diagnosis that if corrected, can give them a, a normal life. Mostly what I do is sports medicine. Obviously the picture on the left is Tom Brady, who when I was in California was a patient of mine. Picture me on the right is me doing a Tommy John surgery with Dr. Neil Elitraj, uh, who's the leader in the nation of Tommy John surgery. And he was trained by Dr. Frank Job, who invented the Tommy John surgery. 
Um, some of the things I do, uh, an example of a cool diagnosis is we discovered thoracic outlet syndrome where people have uh, pressure on the nerves and the blood vessels in their, in their neck, which causes numbness and discoloration in their hands. We discovered a major league baseball player was, was able to remove the first rib, take off the compression. He was able to get back to the major leagues. I see people with rotator cuff tears all the time. The muscles let you go up and out and in. Um, you have to know what they do. So I call them the sits muscle, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, the subscapularis. If I know where the origin, insertion, action, innervation is, if somebody has a tear of one of these muscles, I can discover it on physical exam. Then I can confirm with an MRI and I can see if it's something that will heal with time and physical therapy or if I need to fix it surgically. This is a cartoon drawing of how we fix it surgically. We put sutures through the tendon that's torn and we anchor it back down to the bone. Here's a picture before and after of me looking at the rotator cuff tear. On the left, you see that nice little gap where it's off the bone. On the right, you see me suturing it back down. This is a video I did of me pulling on the torn rotator cuff when I'm inside the shoulder with my tiny little camera. And the second part of the video is after I fixed it. I do 90% of my surgeries arthroscopically, which means I make a one centimeter incision outside the joint. I put my camera in there and then I can put my tools through other one centimeter incisions. So surgeries that used to require a big incision and one or two weeks in the hospital now require small incisions and they go home the same day. Shoulder dislocations, people pop their shoulders out due to trauma, seizures, being electrocuted. We have to reduce it, put it back in. And if they injured something called their labor and we fix it, this is kind of a cool idea for research. And even though it wasn't the greatest project, I got asked about it on every single interview. A shoulder immobilizer can cost up to $250. And I worked in Detroit where a lot of our patients were uninsured, homeless, didn't have the type of money. If you dislocate a shoulder and when you reduce it, you don't immobilize it correctly, they're gonna dislocate it over and over again. Every time they do it, they damage the bones, the cartilage, the muscles. So what me, one of my co-residents did is we ran around the hospital and we found all these supplies that exist in an ER and we made a shoulder mobilizer. We added all the supplies together and it cost $18. So we wrote up how to do it. We did a video demonstration. We found a very handsome model to model the shoulder mobilizer. And we published it in a journal. And now people from all over the country that work in inner cities can immobilize their patients for less cost. So if you're looking for a research project, you can come up with simple solutions to simple problems and people are really, really impressed. Let's talk about a biceps tear. Everybody knows where their biceps is. It's connected by the elbow and by the shoulder. And sometimes if we overstress the biceps, we can tear it. You get something called a Popeye sign when you tear it by the elbow. The biceps goes up towards the shoulder. Uh, you get some bruising when this happens. Here's a video. So you can see there his biceps popped up and retracted. And what we do is we make a small incision in the cubital fossa. We find the tendon, like in that top left-hand corner, we suture it. I drill a small hole in the radius at the biceps tuberosity. I dunk the, the, the biceps back down. I hold it together with a button and a screw. Here's a cartoon rendering. And then here's an x-ray. So a biceps tear is kind of a combination of trauma and sports medicine that me as an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine doctor takes care of. Meniscus, 85% of my life is knee scopes and ligaments. This is a picture with my tiny camera I'm taking during surgery. The top smooth, beautiful portion is the bottom of your femoral condyle, beautiful white cartilage. On the bottom, you see the top of the tibial plateau. In the middle, you see the meniscus. I'm guessing most of you young people have knees that look like this, but when you get to be my age and older, you start to get arthritic with meniscus tears. But this is my life, is restoring function of people's knees. Sometimes you get giant meniscus tears, like the picture on the left. I go in there and I suture it back together like the picture on the right. But I have to know you have a meniscus tear by your history and physical exam. Do you have pain? When I push on it, does not hurt? When I do something called a McMurray's, which is a twisting injury, do you have pain? Uh, this is an MRI of another structure in the knee, the quadriceps tendon. You can see it's torn there. I have to be able to diagnose that by your injury and by your physical exam, you tore that structure. Can you not do a straight leg raise? If you can't, that means you tore your quadriceps or your patellar tendon. This is me putting my finger in the defect, obviously palpating where that quad tendon used to be. This is a cartoon rendering of doing an incision in the front of the knee, finding the quad defect, suturing it, and anchoring it back down the patella. 
here's an intraoperative picture of the front of the knee where we've sutured up that quad tendon and anchored it back down. Here's a picture of the knee ligaments. We have four ligaments in the knee, the ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. I fixed over 200 ligaments in the body last year, 140 were ACLs. That's how I make my living. I wish it were this easy. You either tore your ACL or you haven't. Uh, I wish it were uh, like a pregnancy test, but unfortunately it's not. You need to know how to do a physical exam. You need to know how to read it on, on MRI. This is Zach Efron had his ACL fixed in my surgical center in California. Uh, it's kind of funny when all these actors and actresses, musicians and athletes are putting all the pictures on Instagram afterward. But um, like I said, we worked on the highest level celebrity in the world and we treated them right. And then I bring all that now to uh, the treatment to my patients. When you tore your ACL, you use the non-contact pivot twist and injury. We have 63 participants on this talk today. Odds are we have at least one person who's torn their ACL. Think about playing soccer running and all of a sudden planting to run after somebody or the ball, you feel a pop. Afterwards, you swell up. You may not be that painful, but if you've ever seen it with somebody on the field, look at a knee and do what we call an anterior drawer. If you get increased translation of the tibia, anterior of the femur, you tore your ACL. Here's an MRI picture of a nice ACL, beautiful, nice, thick black line going from the tibia to the femur. Here's one that's torn. It looks like basically a rubber band that's exploded. How do we fix it? This once again is the anterior drawer that I can test the maneuver on. Here's a picture intraoperatively of a good ACL. On the left-hand side, you can see one that's torn. It kind of balled up like a rubber band. On the right-hand side, you can see after I fixed it, nice, smooth, good tissue. We have three different options for fixing an ACL because what we have to do, we can't repair it. We have to take your tissue to make a new one. So we can either use your hamstrings, part of your quadriceps or your patellar tendon. Which one you get is based on surgeon preference. I'm one of the few surgeons that can do all three. So I base it on my patient population. If you're a young, healthy patient who plays sports, I use your patellar tendon. If you're a really young patient um, under the age of 18 uh, who doesn't do contact sports, I'll use your hamstring. If you're under the age of 40 and you're, and you're a runner, swimmer, biker, I'll use your quad. Here's intraoperative pictures. The left is the old torn ACL. The middle is me shooting my guide pin, and the right is me drilling a tunnel where the new ACL is going to go through. This is the femur. The left is where the old ACL used to be. The middle is my guide, and the right is the new tunnel. Here is the first picture on the left. On the right is the ACL at the end. This is actually a University of Michigan State lacrosse player. I was able to fix him and get him back on the field. In addition to doing some sports medicine, I do take care of arthritis as well. If you look at the x-ray on the left, beautiful knee, good bones, smooth, and no osteophytes or bone spurs in between. On the right, we have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Usually if you're older, overweight, labor, or you've had trauma. Um, you get pain, swelling. Sometimes you notice when the weather changes. Uh, on x-ray, you see these changes. So how do we handle it? We do a knee replacement. We cut away the bottom femur bone and the top tibial bone and the cartilage we place with metal and plastic. Here's a bone, but here, here's an x-ray before surgery and x-ray after surgery. Basically, we take out just that little bit of bone and replace it with metal, metal with plastic in between. And patient's pain is gone because they no longer have that bone on bone feeling. Um, once again, a couple more pictures of the, of the straightforward AP and the lateral x-rays. You can also do partial knee replacements. Sometimes only one part of a patient's knee is arthritic. So instead of replacing the entire thing, I only replace the part I need to. I do something called robotic assisted knee replacement where I do the surgery, but the robot tells me where to cut, how much bone to take away. It's kind of fascinating. If I start going crazy and taking away too much bone, I even get half a millimeter out of the way, the robot shuts off on me. So it makes sure I stays in my plane. Here's a video of me doing it on a cadaver. Pretty cool. So it's still me doing the surgery, uh, but the robot helps me where to cut. My typical day as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, sports medicine doctor, is I either do clinic or the operating room. In clinic, I'll see anywhere between 30 to 50 patients, which is possible because I work with a physician assistant, and I usually have either a resident or a fellow with me. If it's an OR day, which I, I operate one to three days a week, I'll usually do anywhere between four to eight surgeries a day. 
Um, my surgeries usually go between half an hour. My longest one is two and a half hours. Um, I don't have a long attention span. So once I get two hours into a surgery, I start to get a little antsy. So I, I picked a good profession where as long as I have a good plan and stay on target, I can get my surgeries done in a, in a relatively quick amount of time. I do participate in a little bit of a research. Um, I don't have a great gift for writing manuscripts, but I do have a good, good ideas and I do have a good patient population. So I'll collaborate with other people who are gifted. I do do team coverage, whether it's the Detroit Tigers, FC Fire, or high school teams, which means I cover games. Um, sometimes I have to go to the field and see players. Sometimes I have to travel for games, spring training or playoffs. I lecture to the medical school about 15 times a year. So preparing those lectures and, and seeing them in the anatomy lab. And then there's always meetings, meetings, meetings. No matter where you're at, no, there's always gonna be meetings for you. Um, so are you a future orthopod like this kid right here? Um, is this something you're interested in the future? I always say it's the greatest profession on earth. Um, very quickly, you get uh, results. If you fix a broken bone, they feel better within a couple of weeks. If you fix someone's ACL rotator cuff, they feel better a couple of months. Um, not to rag on medicine, but a lot of times you're treating conditions like hypertension, diabetes, uh, things that you'll have to treat them for the rest of their life and just try to keep them healthy. My patients, once they do well, they leave my office. They don't want to come back and see me. I'm okay if they don't come back and see me. So usually I, I get to know patients for three months to a year. Then they go out and live their lives, but, uh, but they always come back. They always seem to hurt something else or they refer someone who hurt someone else. So um, I like the graduation of treatment. I like people coming to me, getting treated, then leaving. I, I don't like seeing patients forever because I feel like that means I'm not doing my job. I wanna thank you. Hopefully that wasn't too long. Hopefully not too gross by some of the pictures or videos. Hopefully you guys really liked it. If you wanna contact me, um, sometimes it can take me one or two days to get back to you, but I have my email address on here. Uh, I have a website with some of my information on there. I try to be active on social media, on Instagram uh, and on Facebook. So I appreciate if you guys will follow me and definitely uh, hit me up so I follow you. We have a really good medical community on these platforms and Twitter where we bounce cases off each other. Uh, sometimes we have people, we say, hey, I've got a medical student who needs a residency spot, or I've got somebody who needs to get a medical school, and we try to help each other. So Med Twitter is a really good community for the most part, and, and I hope that you're a part of it or that you join it. Um, and now I'll, I'll defer to the host. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. This is a wonderful presentation. I don't know if you could see uh, some of the faces in the Zoom call, but there's just fascination all around with the pictures that you showed. <laughs> a quite incredible career that you had. Um, so we'll get right into questions. My students I'll also uh, invite you that if you want to ask your questions directly to Dr. Cook, you're more than welcome to use the raise hand feature in the reactions button down below, um, and we'll help facilitate you asking the questions on mic. Okay, so one of the first questions that we got was from Josh, and he asked, how did you get uh, into working with athletes? What did you gain? Oh, was that gain for your residency, or how did you get into that profession specifically? Uh, really good question. Most orthopedic surgery residency programs uh, have a sports department. So if, if you are gonna be an orthopedic surgeon, you're going to be exposed to sports medicine. Um, to me, being a college athlete, somebody who really loves fitness, that was something I pursued and I sought out. So as a resident uh, in my residency, we were the team doctors for the Pistons, uh, Red Wings and Tigers. So I got to know those physicians and I started volunteering saying, can I come with you to practice? Can I come with you to games? I started bouncing questions off them and obviously my interest was met with good, some good feedback. Um, that's why I pursued that fellowship to, to also go into that. Um, and then now in my career, it's, it's definitely extra. Um, I spend a lot of time away from work and my family going to practices and games, but um, only few people get to do this on the highest level. And the fact that I've got the ability right now gives me a lot of pride in my job. And so I'm gonna to continue to pursue it. Um, but, but I think once you get to that level of residency, it's definitely available. Most of my classmates did not pursue it. Out of the 20 residents in my program, I think only one other one into sports. Um, but once you get to that level, it, it's very easy to get into if that's your passion. Thank you for your detailed explanation. That was super, super helpful. So thank you. Uh, so another audience member named Gavin has asked, when you said that you met with each of the schools, did you reapply each time? I did. I did. Uh, and you know, it's hard to talk about sometimes. That was a very tough time in my life because I, I really, really wanted to go to medical school and um, rejection is tough, but um, I thought I was close. Um, I, I knew my GPAs and I, I hate to depress you guys. You guys are all smarter than I am. It was easier to get into medical school 15 years ago. It's 
so difficult now. I give you all credit if that is what you're pursuing. But, um, you know, I, I just met with them and I'm, I'm a very normal person. I feel like I'm somewhat humble. Failure is something to learn from. And I said, listen, I'm not asking you to guarantee me. I'm not asking for you to promise me, but find two holes in my application and give me some recommendations. And once I filled them, I met with them again and I applied again. And, and the second time I applied was really only about nine months after the first rejection. So um, you know, there wasn't a lot of improvement because I still was doing things. But by the third time I applied, I'd gotten my master's. I'd gotten, you know, another 40 credits of, by that point, 4.0. Um, I'd done some more, re I'd done some volunteering. And they were like, this guy really put a lot of work in. And obviously they all felt that way because out of the five med schools I applied to, I got into four of them my third time. So, you know, they're not just going to meet with anybody and it might take a couple of weeks or months to get the appointment. But if this is what you want, pick out the couple of schools you're really passionate about, find out what their mission is and, and try to hit their check marks and, and do what they, they need you to do. And it's no guarantee you'll get in, but at least you're showing effort. And I'll definitely take somebody who works hard over somebody who is naturally smart enough any day. Yeah, thanks for sharing that really honest opinion and um, yeah, giving that insight into uh, how that school is different back then and how hard it is now. Uh, going off of this, uh, Emily has asked, do you think that the prestige of your medical school will matter more after step one, um, now that it is past fail for competitive specialties? Uh, really good question. And we've definitely talked about that. Um, I don't think it's gonna matter less. My school's different, even though we are an academic center, um, we're probably anywhere between the top 20, top 40 academic centers. So we're, we're not as interested as getting the top of the top. And, and even though I love living in Michigan, Detroit's probably not one of the top five or 10 cities people really feel passionate about going to the United States. So. For us, we're more of a blue collar program. We're probably gonna to continue to take the people from Wayne State, Michigan State, inner city schools in Ohio, Illinois, um, Indiana. Like we like, we don't really care where, where you go to medical school. If you do go to somewhere that is a little more focused in academics, a little more in research, they may have that opinion. I really feel like the majority of orthopedic surgery is going away from that. Um, I think it matters more in your rotations. Um, so to me, the prestige doesn't, doesn't help. There might be a couple of schools where it does, but, but orthopedic surgery is usually a little more laid back. We're not as uptight as the, as the general surgeons. I think at the end of the day, it just matters on your work ethic and what your letters say. I don't think it matters on where you went to school. Nice. That's pretty relieving to say the least. Uh, and so Liam uh, asked, if so many aspects of the pre-health pipeline don't really end up making a person a better doctor, why do we keep doing them? He's referencing the exams and other academic factors relating to moving forward in the pre-health path. It's a good question. Um, and those were my Achilles heel. I, I feel like that was the most difficult part for me. I, I will say, and it's easy for me to say now that I'm through it, you have to have a baseline level of understanding. And certainly that doesn't mean that you need to know organic chemistry to be an orthopedic surgeon, but I will say there is something about going through the problems of organic chemistry, figuring out the pattern, trying to find the solution. It's not that much different than when you have a patient who has a injury, history, x-ray exam, going through trying to find a solution. So I think jumping through these hurdles are trying to help you become a problem solver, kind of like a Dr. House, get all the information and make the decision. Um, you could argue that maybe the way we do it in this country takes too long. You, you could say that maybe it's not the best way to do it, but at the end of the day, you have to understand the pathology to a point. And maybe going past fail for step one is a step in the right direction. It doesn't matter if you understand everything or just understand it well enough to become a doctor but you have to have a baseline level of learning. And I think that's why we make people jump through these hoops of exams and whatnot. Um, once again, it's not perfect. I think a lot of medical doctors are realizing that some of the, some of the exams are kind of money-making schemes, um, but you have to have some, some sort of, of level to pass. And, and I think we're doing a better job of trying to scale it down, but that's why, that's my opinion at least. Yeah, that's super insightful. Thank you for that. But in the beginning, uh, some audience members and I heard about how you talked about how you don't like the direction that medicine was headed towards. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not an old man yelling at the cloud, but there are some things changing. Um, medicine is amazing. The majority of hospitals are run by non-physicians, people with MBAs, CEOs, and it's frustrating because it seems like a lot of decisions are made to improve hospital profitability and not for patient care. 
And that's frustrating. And that's why a lot of doctors get their MBAs and they go back into it uh, afterwards. Um, it's no uh, secret that physician reimbursements decreasing as far as inflation and, and, and the rest of um, you know, compensation. Now, that being said, my dad paints houses. I, I make more money in a year than, than he made in five or 10 years. I'm not going to starve. I'm very fortunate to get paid to do what I love. So if you ever hear a doctor complain about money, you probably should tell him to chill out a little bit. But that being said, you know, we're doing the work, we're taking care of the patients, we're putting our license at risk, and it seems like everyone else is profiting from it. So, for example, I had a patient who didn't have insurance who broke their ankle. I actually fixed it and I waived my fee. I told them I will not charge you for this. And they came back and they said, I got a $8,000 bill. I said, that must be some mistake. I waived my fee. And I called the hospital like, yeah, you waived your fee. Um, your cut's only $700. And I said, how are they getting charged for all this when I'm the one doing all the work? And so when I met the direction medicine's going in, a lot of people complain, especially people who've been in medicine for 30 years because they saw how it used to be and how it's changing. I think the only way for us to improve it is for us to change it. I wouldn't change what I do for the world, but things are changing and we can do a better job of changing them. So that's what I meant, not to be pessimistic or dissuade you guys at all, but that's what I meant. Yeah, just talking about money and profitability, that could take like another whole session. So thank yeah. you for that honesty. Yeah, you were actually talking about a question that an audience member had asked because Bhakti had asked, how do you approach working with patients who may not have had medical insurance or the money to get surgery that they need? I'm, I'm really fortunate. Um, my hospital, is, even though it's private, it still is nonprofit. Um, and to me, not that it would make a difference, but I personally don't benefit financially if you have insurance or not, or what insurance you have. I can treat anybody. We have a lot of people who work at the hospital who work on getting patients Medicaid or Medicare, sometimes retroactively, because obviously if you have a broken bone, you don't want to wait months for your insurance to kick in. So to me, it doesn't change the course. If you have something wrong with you and you need treatment, I'm able to offer it. But luckily, there's people in positions who can work with patients to get them that approval because you don't want someone going into debt or you don't want somebody getting a bill. So to me, it doesn't change my approach. It just means I need to get them to the right people who can help them. Yeah, that's really inspiring. Like you going in and treating other patients with their uh, physical needs, but also with their like mental needs, like helping with their stress financially. So thank you. And so this would go along with Liam's question. So considering your profession, how can we as future health professionals help improve access to care for disabled patients? Uh, I, think, I think exposure. I think um, trying to find a way for patients to either come to get the information for insurance or for checkups or a way to reach out. Uh, a lot of times in Detroit, we would go, um, you know, to churches, to homeless shelters, places that people will go, even though they won't necessarily go to the hospital. We had a couple of um, medical student run clinics for free, just doing simple things like taking blood pressures and physical exams. Um, you know, for the most part, people don't want to stay home, even though, you know, present year COVID excluded, uh, people will go out, whether it's for religious or for social reasons. And if you can bring the healthcare access to those places, it's a good way for those people not to deviate from their normal routine and to still get the care. And so you mentioned those clinics. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I tell you from Wayne State University specifically, they had something called Cass Clinic, which um, maybe one or two doctors would oversee, but basically it was a place in Detroit where patients who weren't insured um, could go and medical student volunteers would be there to do physical exams, to, to use their stethoscope, to practice their skills by trying to uh, see patients and make sure that they didn't have undiagnosed hypertension, make sure that they gave them information on how to eat properly. If somebody had something more seriously, direct them to the appropriate place. And I think most medical schools in inner city areas have those. Um, and that's something good to get involved with. And even as a uh, non-medical student, somebody trying to get into medical school, you definitely could volunteer with them. So at Wayne State University, specifically in Detroit, it's called CAS Clinic. But if you uh, look at your med school or you ask, do you have a, um, a medical school run clinic? I, I guarantee they will. And I guarantee they'd appreciate any volunteering. And then that's something you put on application. That's something you could talk about during an interview. And so with this CAS Clinic, this would be a really great idea because uh, the audience today is mostly full of undergraduate students like myself and high school students. And so would there be like certification or training needed to volunteer? 
I don't believe so. Um, they may at this point want to make sure you've had a, a COVID vaccine when it's appropriate. Um, I think maybe a flu shot or TB test is what we'd look for, but um, no, I think just contacting and saying I'm, I'm pre-health, uh, I'm very interested. Can I help out? And at the very least, going in there and helping, you know, uh, help with name tags and help, uh, you know, patients who, who need their blood pressure taken. I think that'd be a way to reach out. Find your nearest medical school, see if they have outreach programs like that, and see, you know, if you're over the age of 18, if they're willing to let you volunteer. Yeah, thank you so much. I think a lot of people are going to be relieved by this because the COVID pandemic has limited our opportunities. And so I see that an audience member, I'm going to take a break here. Josh is going to ask a question. So hi, Josh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank, thanks for the session. Uh, yeah, so I'm an undergrad student right now, and I'm actually really interested in sports medicine. And I just was wondering if you had any uh, kind of advice or um, opinions on the, the kind of different routes to sports medicine, because I know you did orthopedics, but uh, for example, when I was doing research about it, I, I kind of established that my most likely entry point would probably be more so like, per, uh, what's it called, uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, that type of route. And I was just wondering if you had any, you had any type of take on the different roots into it and if it made a difference? Uh, definitely. It's definitely um, a, a team effort when you're working with athletes and it's not just physicians, it's athletic trainers, it's physical therapists, physician assistants. Um, you know, a lot of people work together uh, to take care of these athletes. Athletic trainers more are in the high schools and colleges on the field day to day taking care of the athletes. And when smaller injuries um, need to be x-rayed or seen by a physician, they refer them. Um, physical therapists help either rehab people who have had injuries or try to prevent injuries. As far as, uh, as medical doctors, orthopedic surgeons um, are more the ones who obviously do the surgery, but, but see a lot of the patients as well and can treat them non-operatively. Physical medicine and rehabilitation does a lot of that non-operative treatment as well. Um, they are a little more closely aligned with the physical therapist with the occupational therapists, sometimes with social workers, if somebody's been in an accident, um, they help them make sure they continue to have the right therapy, bracing, medications, rehab. Sometimes they can do other things like neurological exams, things called EMGs to test your nerve conduction. Um, sometimes they can do injections into the joints or the muscles. So PM and our doctor can do just about all the non-surgical things an orthopedic surgeon can do. And they also work a little bit more on the social aspects, making sure patients are getting the appropriate therapy and care and bracing. So uh, I definitely have some friends who went into the field, really, really enjoy it. You do a lot of great work with accident victims, both motor vehicle accident and spinal trauma. Um, for me, I liked the challenge of doing surgery and that's why I went more the orthopedic surgery route, but, but PM&R doctor is definitely very rewarding. Um, probably have a little better of a work-life balance than orthopedic surgeons, um, probably do a little bit more of the three to four days of clinic a week, don't need to take call and things like that. Um, but no, I think that's a really excellent route. And that's probably something that when you get to medical school, you do rotations in both and see which one you like more. Awesome. Thanks. That's, that's a really good response. So then um, uh, at what point did you realize that orthopedics was kind of the path you wanted to take because for example if if one person wants if multiple people want to end up in sports medicine as as i mentioned there are many ways to go about it so then like at what point did you realize surgery was something you wanted to do and something that you would be capable of uh once so once i got into medical school i knew a couple of people had been orthopedic surgeons and, and they had a very similar personality and outlook as me so that was always the the preference but you have to make sure you can do surgery. And from the first day in my medical school anatomy, I mean, you're, you're either going to be able to dissect anatomy or you're not. And, um, and, and once you start doing that, you get comfortable, then you watch other people do surgery. And if you can do that, do comfortable, then you try to do it. And there's some people, I mean, some people just don't have the stomach for it. I'm not great with non-bone and muscle things. I've been in a couple general surgeries with organs and, and, and brain surgery. I think that's gross. I, I could never do it. So to me, that grosses me out. Um, and so I learned that about myself. But the really great thing about the majority of medical schools is they spend the first two years just teaching you. You got to relearn your biochemistry, your anatomy, your physiology. You got to really focus on 
your organ systems, then your third and fourth year, you get to try everything. And there's going to be some things you hate and you got to learn them. And then you're done with them. Other things you love. It can be tough if you love more than one thing, but, but somebody once said, everybody should try to do surgery unless you realize that you, that you don't like it or you weren't meant for it. And I thought surgery was such a challenge. I decided to try it. And if I thought I could do it and if I was accepted, I would. And I was very fortunate that I was. But luckily, that's not something you need to decide now. You, you have the opportunity once you're in medical school. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And one, one last quick question. Uh, in terms, I, I was going to ask about the opportunities with athletes. And I was just wondering, is there a difference between uh say the orthopedics and the physiatrists and things like that or is it all are all the opportunities essentially equal just in different capacities so orthopedic surgeons have more of an opportunity with athletes there's actually a new fellowship called sports medicine for non-surgeons a lot of primary care doctors internal medicine pediatrics er family medicine even pmnr We'll do this one year sports medicine fellowship afterwards. And people who do that fellowship do have the opportunity to work with athletes. So some, uh, one of my former partners actually just got announced he's going to go to the Olympics in two years as one of the physicians. So there are plenty of opportunities. You'll probably need a little further training, but like I said, one year fellowships, not that bad. Um, and you can do it from basically any single um, residency. Um, the majority of time it's orthopedic surgeons, but, but non-operative sports medicine doctors are becoming more and more popular all the time. I probably can name 20 to 25 off just the top of my head in the Detroit area by itself. So the opportunity is definitely there, but as a PM&R doctor, if that's what you end up pursuing, you'll probably need a little extra training afterwards. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting because I'm actually in Canada and when I was looking into it, it requires uh, like some of the main ways to go about it were, for example, PM&R and then like you said, a sports medicine fellowship afterwards. So honestly, I wasn't sure if it was the exact same type of thing in the US, but I, I guess it is. <laughs> All right, so, well, good luck. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Have a nice day. Thank you, Dr. Cook, for uh, your answers. And thank you, Josh, for guest co-hosting today. Those, those were really awesome questions. Uh, well, C has asked a question that went along with Josh's first question because you... an orthopedic doctor and an ER doctor. Definitely an ER doctor, kind of, kind of like how you see on TV, are the first medical responders once you get to the hospital. Uh, you're brought in usually by EMS or you're driven there. They see and evaluate you. They try to figure out what the problem is. Um, ER doctors, you know, they have a little bit of knowledge in every single specialty. So for a simple finger laceration, they're going to be more than qualified to sew you up. For a little bit of chest pain, for somebody who is in the early stages of pregnancy, they can recognize these things and then they direct you to the next step. So something like that, that finger laceration, an ER doctor is not going to have the skills to fix it, but they can recognize the injury and call orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, hand surgery. Um, smaller uh, finger lax and ER doctor could sew up. In my actual residency, we had the ER residents spend a month with orthopedic surgery. So they learned how to reduce basic fractures and sew certain things. And, and the ER doctors, had I not done orthopedic surgery, I would have done emergency medicine. They were some of my best friends. To this day, they'll still call me saying, I've got this in the ER. Do I have to call orthopedic surgery or can I put a cast on it and send them to clinic? And so they wouldn't sew up that type of injury, but ER doctors get to do all the trauma. And uh, if the trauma is a little higher level, if it needs surgery, then they call surgery and they pass it off from there. That's really interesting how um, the different kind of professions and specialties are able to work together. And I think that's also really valuable to see how um, each person kind of fits in and within the professions. So a question we had from Sahel was, are there any significant cases that have stayed with you in the long run and that does, and do they um, change your mindset? And how have these like changed your mindset on your career and your profession and what you do in your day to day? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a great question. Probably for anything, for any, any field and, and anything in life, something is going to stick out. You know, I, I still remember um, some surgeries from training, but after a while they kind of blend in together, but you more remember surgeons 
um, yeah, you know, men and women who the way they operate or the way they treated people or the way they treated patients um, and trainees, you, you definitely want to model yourself after the good ones and avoid the bad ones. Um, not every surgery goes well. I've had complications and though it's funny, even though complication rates are very low as a sports medicine surgeon, I'm very fortunate complication rates, you know, probably anywhere between two to 3%. Those are the patients you remember. Um, and certain steps during surgery, I might say, hey, I did this one time and this happened. And for example, when you're doing a shoulder replacement, as you put the components in there, if you hit the components too hard when you're putting them in, you can fracture the bone. I've done that before. So now whenever I put the components in there, I remember that. Um, I've had patients, uh, you know, I, I've had patients who had complications and, and those are the ones that, that more stick with you and you have to treat it like a learning experience. And Certainly, you never want to tell the patients because you I've changed the way I do things. But um, but if you're going to keep on making the same mistakes over and over again, I think there's something wrong with you. And, and I certainly make a lot of mistakes, but I try never to make the same mistake twice. So um, my first surgery, I still remember my first ACL. I remember my first total knee. I remember. Um, and then some patients who've done really, really well, you know, stick out of my mind. Some of them, we follow each other on social media. And if they're playing sports or if they're accomplishing goals that sticks out and unfortunately a couple of patients haven't done well and those are the ones you know I read a lot of books by surgeons those are the ones sometimes you stare awake at the ceiling and those are the ones that are in your head so um, no every single patient stays with you and for the most part for the betterment but um, definitely changes your mindset on how to treat certain people. Absolutely um, so kind of going along with what you're talking about as far as working with um, different surgeons and having memories of that. Um, it's kind of well known that females are kind of the minority in surgical specialties. And so maybe um, how, so one question that Sailor had was how often do you work with female surgeons? And I would add on to that and kind of ask like, how have you noticed maybe different treatment and how do you think more people can become interested in surgery and we can like equalize the field? It's a, it's a good question. And, and uh, orthopedic surgery is very, very male dominated, as is neurosurgery. Um, there has been a really nice effort to try to have the less represented people, uh, you know, get the opportunities in these surgeries, uh, whether, you know, it, it's your gender, uh, whether it's your ethnicity, you know, there definitely seems to be more opportunity for the majority to, to become a surgeon or a big surgeon, the minority. So a lot of programs have gone out of their way to try to offer training from the high school, college, medical student level to those populations underrepresented. Not to say that you have to do surgery if you are in the minority of gender or ethnicity or sexual preference, but you should have the ability to make that decision for yourself. So I think the fact that all these programs are incentivizing and talking about it, and I definitely read a lot of publications for orthopedic surgery, we say this is something we need to improve upon. 6%, which is the number of minorities in orthopedic surgery, is far too low, uh, and we need to improve that. I can tell you that um, from this standpoint, um, like I said, I'm in a very good program that's not in an academic era. Um, so we get really good candidates, but we don't we don't get, you know, the, the top from the Ivy League schools when we have a candidate who is from an upper underrepresented population. We give them a little bit more of an advantage because we are trying to diversify not only our own program, but orthopedic surgery in general. Uh, so I think that if you are an upper underrepresented population and you have an interest in one of these areas, let it be known and the, the tide has turned where program directors and programs really want to give you that opportunity and that doesn't mean you'll automatically get it but it means that we're making an effort and if you are an underrepresented person um, don't let that sway you because there's nothing about somebody's gender or their ethnicity or sexual preference that makes them a better surgeon or doctor than anything else uh, some people for orthopedic surgery say you have to be strong you don't. Um, strength can help, but technique trumps all. And I've worked with some people that are either smaller in stature or, or they're females um, or they're not athletic and they might be as good if not better surgeons than anyone else because they know what they're doing. So um, I don't think that any surgeons treat anyone differently, but it's definitely a problem we've recognized. And, and if, you know, I see from the few people have their videos on that we have a, you know, a great melting pot of people on this call. Don't let the fact that um, orthopedic surgery is underrepresented prevent you from pursuing it if that's your interest. Thank you, I think that's so important and definitely it's about giving that opportunity and the, it's um, equitable opportunities. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, we have to force people into um, whatever, you know, certain fields, but it is good to know that people do have the opportunity and they don't feel 
pushed out or marginalized by um, just the general culture in, in a work environment. Um, so another question we had was from Gavin and it was about how hard was balancing your um, balancing life with a significant other and a family during medical school training and kind of what advice do you have for current undergraduates or pre-professionals as they're going in as we're transferring into that part phase in our life but then also trying to you know maintain that work-life balance should i answer that question should I have my wife come over here and answer <laughs> I'm question? Shaking my, head right now. <laughs> my wife is working from home right now um it is very very difficult it's difficult whether you have a family or whether you don't um Looking back, I was probably in a little bit of a unique situation. Um, I started, I met my wife my senior year of college, uh, and it was pretty obvious, you know, right away that, that we knew we were going to continue dating and eventually get married. Um, once I got into medical school, I didn't want to just date throughout medical school because medical school is very stressful. Not that undergraduate isn't, but there's a lot of ups and downs. I didn't think that was fair to her to make me live through the ups and downs. And, um, and so we got married uh, after between my first and second year of medical school. Um, and I often tell people without having that support, I, I would not have made it through medical school or residency. So to me, it wasn't even about balancing it. it, it to me, it was a necessity. Um, but that's not everybody. Most people in medical school are single. And um, I think if you are going to balance it, you need to know that your career is really, really important. And you need to jump through these hoops and you need to pass these tests and you need to do all the things they need you to do to become a doctor. But at the end of the day, no one's going to remember you as a doctor. Uh, you know, I love my patients. I love my work. But if I quit or if something happened to me, they'd be able to replace me pretty quickly. Like nothing, nothing's more important than your family. So that needs to be your number one priority. If you have a good significant other, they're going to realize that there's going to be a lot of trials and tribulations. There's going to be a lot of nights you go to sleep while you're studying. A lot of times you're in your bad mood. But if you guys support each other, um, you know, I think our life right now is, is, is pretty great. And um, sometimes I need to be reminded, work less, family more. I've got two beautiful kids. I've got a great wife. You know, I've, I've got great family. I take pride in my work. I work pretty hard. But if your balance is out of whack and you put too much emphasis on work, then you're going to end up having a couple different families because your, your, your family's not going to stick around for too long. So it's difficult, but I can tell you it would have been much harder had I not had a family during my training. So to me, it was a necessity, but all I can say is have your priorities in the right position. Um, be nice to your significant other because they're they're being really, really nice to you. And um, I hope all of you get as lucky as me for having somebody that supported me as much as I did. Thank you. That was to, I like that answer a lot. It was so sweet. Um, Josh, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, so I have a question regarding research and shadowing and scribing and those types of things so uh be, like you said beyond the gpa and the mcat which is kind of you know almost a prerequisite um and then having volunteering and other kind of activities and work that show you know that you're busy and show that you're interested in things but when it comes to things that are more related to the field uh what what would you what would you say is most important in terms of sh scribing, shadowing, research, things like that. Because for example, this summer, I, I'm i gonna be doing some research with a professor in the Fox of Medicine on tendons and tendon length and tendinopathy. So, I mean, it's it, I don't think it's gonna be, it's not really clinical because we're gonna be analyzing MRI scans and I've never done anything like that. So it's pretty interesting, but... Uh, how, how would you kind of prioritize those type of things? Because I've heard that it's really important to show some type of understanding of actual, uh, you know what I'm saying, like of the actual clinical side of things. So whether that's shadowing or scribing or, yeah. So for people trying to get into medical school, which it seems like a lot of the people on this call, um, GPA, MCAT, that that's going to get you into the two piles. Do you get an interview or do you don't? And that it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Uh, but once you get in that pile of interviews, then it really matters on your experiences and personality. I think research is really important and, and it doesn't have to be amazing research. It doesn't have to be life altering, but you have to understand what's going on and whether it's clinical or, or whether it's basic science. And to me, I think the basic science is almost more interesting. And I did both. Um, the way the applications are in the States, unfortunately, you get rewarded more for quantity than quality. You know, they, they want all your different projects and you could spend 5,000 hours on a project that got published, 
or 10 hours on 10 projects that, that you really didn't do much on. And they, they might look at the quantity as more important, but I ask every single applicant about their research. And if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't know what you wrote about, if you, if you said you worked on this project and you can't tell me anything about the project, how it was set up, what the results were, that does not bode well in your favor. So the fact that you're do, potentially doing some research on tendon length and things, if you throw yourself into it, really get a good understanding of what you're looking for and how you're doing it, I don't care about the outcome. I'm going to ask you about it. I'm going to be very impressed that you did the work. Uh, if you're reading MRIs, show me how you read an MRI. I look at MRIs every single day. If you can teach me how to read something about a tendon from an MRI, I'll be impressed. I actually think that's more impressive than shadowing or scribing. Um, other things are, are maybe missions trips, whether they're religious or not. If you go somewhere in the world that's underrepresented, you can help them with their medical care. If you tell me you went to um, the Philippines, or if you tell me you went to somewhere in Africa, if you went to someplace that was underrepresented and you offered care, I don't care if you're getting water. I don't care if you're assisting doctors and holding their bags. I want to know what you did. I want to know where you traveled. I want to know the difference you made. To me, once you get your foot in the door, those are the things that are going to make you jump off the page. Um, scribing is good. It, it's, it's really important. It's going to let you understand things more. I'm not sure how impressive it looks on an application. Um, but to me, research and then medical experience, volunteering, both domestic and abroad, those are the things that I think are going to make you look really, really good. So by that point, it's me asking you questions and you being able to answer them. Oh, okay, that's, that's really interesting. Okay, so then so kind of more specifically, going back to the research, uh, how, how does it how does it affect it, whether, you know, your kind of position in it, because I know some people really strive to, you know, get get their name on the author's list and things like that. But I mean, in reality, not many people are going to be able to do that in undergrad, right? It's for the most part, you're just going to be helping out. And does that really make a huge difference? Or is it more what you can say about it? Like, like you were saying, when you ask questions, you're able to really break it down. As an undergrad, I think it matters more your participation and your understanding of the project. You know, I think we're all pretty cognizant that unless, you know, unless you're in a very odd program or unless you take time off, you're probably not going to publish as an undergrad. But if, but if you work on a project and have a really good understanding of it, that shows that you do have involvement. Um, you know, whether it's collecting data, um, whether it's help preparing PowerPoints or posters, um, you know, the, the more involved you are, the more you'll be able to talk about the project. So I think at this point, you definitely need uh, to be involved, but I wouldn't worry about getting on the, on the author's list. To me, when I interview, uh, you know, applicants for medical school, uh, I don't focus on that. I just focus on the fact that they did research, they can talk about it, that they have an interest. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And then go going back to what you said about the uh, medical, I don't know what you, you could call it, something like Medic, some type of medical experience like volunteering abroad what type of things like that are accessible to undergrad students considering we obviously don't have any formal training and certifications true and in the COVID era now it's even more difficult because travel is limited but um you know there definitely are a lot of religious groups that will do medical missions trips so if you are involved um with that I think that's helpful and uh, you know, a lot of other countries actually don't have the same um, restrictions that we have, which doesn't mean that you can practice medicine, but it means that you might be able to disperse medicine if they allow you to. You might be allowed to assist in surgery in certain places. I have, I have a friend who goes to the Philippines once a year. He's an ENT doctor. I know on the trip, not only are there doctors, but there are volunteers as well. Um, I know the W, I don't know if it's WHO or WHSO, but the World Health Organization, maybe the World Health Student Organization, they constantly do trips and not everyone on there has to be a medical student. So there are organizations that if you volunteer your time, they definitely have positions for you. And that's stuff that can be really, really impressive as well. But you just have to be a little proactive and seek it out. But, um, but I definitely, uh, if you know of a medical school, ask them if they have medical missions trip or if you're involved in religion. Those, those are th some things you can work on that usually already have the resources set up. Although in the COVID area, it may not happen as much in the next year as it's happened in the past. I see, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Fatma, if you would like to um, go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Chris. Uh, quick question. Do you think hospice gives a better understanding of the tolls, of the emotional and physical tolls uh, doctors go through with patients? Do I think hospice? 
yeah, uh, like gives a better understanding of the emotional and physical struggles uh, patients go through with doctors? Um, I think probably people who, who focus on hospice, people who that's their job, they usually have a pretty good understanding of where a patient's coming from. And on a lot of a patient's frustration, if they're in that situation, can be with the people treating them. Um, it's not something I have a huge focus in because I'm very fortunate. The majority of my patients are fairly young and healthy, but people who do pursue geriatrics, hospice care, I think they're very in tune to the struggles a patient's going through. And if a patient is frustrated with medical care or if they're taking out their frustrations on medical care, I think people going into that uh, specialty understand that and, and, can, and can deal with it. Um, you know, I can tell you that most of my patients who do have uh, advanced pathologies, you know, some sort of uh, cancer or, or leukemia lymphoma are fairly grateful to the people that take care of them. And so the, while they're dealing with their own mortality, they usually are more appreciative of medical workers than people who aren't going through that. So I do think it offers good training. If that's an area of interest, I think there's a lot, um, a lot of great things and great people you can help with that. But it's difficult. It's definitely something very, very difficult to do. Thank you. Thank sorry. you. Uh, sorry, mind if I quickly jump in on that same question there? Uh, regarding hospice, how, what do you think about hospice volunteering in terms of application? I think it'd be, it'd be definitely be beneficial. It's, it's a little less done than other types of volunteering. I think as far as a person, it will help you because when you see people going through something like that, it makes you appreciate everything you have. It maybe helps you see how to treat patients in that situation. Cause if you go in the medical field, you're going to meet patients like that. So I think it looks impressive in application and it probably makes you a better person as well. So I think, um, I, I see no reason to say why not. I was lucky in my medical school, we actually had a hospice requirement. Um, I think we had four or five lectures throughout the year that we had to, that we had to shadow it at a hospice environment. So I don't know if all medical schools have that requirement, but I definitely think it's something you should be exposed to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cause I, I've been, uh, well, not recently because of COVID, but the past you know year or two, I've been volunteering at the hospice and children's hospice actually. And I, and I, I always was kind of curious if, you know, those type of things where it's not a hundred percent related are that valuable, but it's good to hear that those types of things are appreciated. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Cook, for giving your time to, your time today. Um, I would just like to open the floor if you have any last advice or any um, final things you want to leave our audience with, since I'm respectful that it is almost um, the end of the hour and a half that we have you for. But I want to thank you again for joining us. And I learned a lot, and I'm sure many of the students here did as well. No, I think you have a great organization. I give you a lot of credit for it. Uh, continue to grow and expand. Um, you know, I wish you guys luck. I will say, I don't know anybody who continually tried to get in the medical field who couldn't. Doesn't mean there weren't a lot of rejections along the way, but if this is something you really want, you'll find a way to make it happen. Study, try to get the grades and the exams because that's important to some people. But if you keep working and show people your work, it may not be the very specific role you wanted, but, but if you keep working, you, you'll, you'll end up succeeding. So when you're really discouraged, just, just remember that. And remember, almost every single doctor you meet struggled at some point. Nobody flew through it. So, um, you know, you take your struggles, you work through them, then you enjoy your triumphs. But I wish you guys luck. Contact me with any questions. And uh, no, good luck to everybody. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Cook. Uh, if you can, so one much. more time, uh, let us know what your email is in case we have extra questions. I'm sorry, students, we didn't have time to answer all the questions that you had. Um, but thank you, Dr. Cook, for offering to uh, answer it afterwards. Um, Absolutely. Uh, my email address, I'll type in right now, it's drchriscook at gmail.com. And my last name is an email. Me, so. Come, okay. Great. Thank you so much again uh, for a wonderful presentation and wonderful insight that you provide us today. I know that I was inspired. I know many of us were probably inspired by your talk. Um, and if you, um, you can feel free to disconnect from the call now. Uh, students stick around. I'm gonna go through how to get your hours here certified. Um, were the pictures too gross or no? No, they were great. I love those. They weren't enough. <laughs> I'll do more next time. You guys have a good day, okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, students, let's see. Everyone see this one? Um, so yeah, thank you again so much for attending today's live Saturday session. Um, as always, we like to take the time after each session to reflect on what brought you to today's session, what are three major takeaways that you got from the session today, and what do you wanna learn more about?
feel free to take a screenshot of this if you like. Um, while these questions are no by, by no means necessary to uh, answer, we do encourage you to take the time to reflect. And if you'd like to, um, you can submit it on our blog submissions page. Um, we also take articles, reviews, and success stories. As Dr. Cook was saying, that publications can look quite impressive on your resumes and applications. So we want to offer this opportunity for you to recognize your hard work um, and all that you do. And once again, if you're interested in becoming part of pre shadowing, we do have um, opportunities on our volunteer and team member team. With our volunteer session or section, you can volunteer asynchronously on projects like grant writing, research, um, social media outreach, professional outreach, you name it, we have, probably have it. Um, as well as you have more time to dedicate, you're welcome to also apply to be our team member and join us up here hosting live sessions. The links for these are also in the chat. You're once again humbly asking that if you're able to donate, um, if you can please use the link to donate $1, $3, $5—whatever is possible—so um, that we can keep our program free and accessible for students all across the world to join us. We do run solely off of time and donations of volunteers, um, and if you're not financially able, we do ask that you consider sending this link to other uh, friends and family members who might be able to donate, and so they can help continue in supporting you and many students in our pre-health journeys. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, how to get your hours here certified. So the first thing you're going to do is go to our course page at prealshadowing.com. You're going to look at the um, current events and find Dr. Chris Cook's uh, course page. From there, you can hit take this course. Um, you'll have the option there to take the quiz for the course. Once you start the quiz, you have 30 minutes to complete it. It's a 10 choice, 10 multiple choice qu question quiz um, based off of the presentation that Dr. Cook provided. You have two or more chances to pass with a 70% or higher. These quizzes are open indefinitely um, for your convenience. And once you finish that quiz and pass, you can hit finish this course. And from there, you will get to have a link to download your certificate. If you run into any issues during this process, please feel free to email us at info at prealshadowing.com. We're more than happy to provide assistance. If you missed any part of today's session or you want to catch up on previous sessions that we've held, you can visit our YouTube channel at Preal Shadowing and you can watch the sessions and also take the post shadowing assessment quiz to rack up those shadowing hours. Be sure to join us again uh, for future sessions throughout this week and through every weekday up until June, I believe we have professionals booked. I really hope to see you at uh, upcoming sessions. And so that concludes today's shadowing session. Thank you again for joining us um, for a lovely uh, live session. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around and we will happily answer your questions. But for now, that's the end of today's shadowing call. You may disconnect. <laughs>